just give knowledge to the Lord, our Savior Jesus to Christ, Minister McMillan, Minister Baldwin, to our deacons, our trustees, our squire, our musician, our ushers, audio video team, to my wife, my mother. To each one of you, my father's children, this is the day, and we should rejoice. Amen. Amen. Not to wear your patience long, but by the aid and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. First John chapter two. First John chapter two. Please again keep your Bibles open that you may follow along with me in this word. First John chapter two, let's look at verses eighteen through twenty-three. First John chapter two, let's look at verses eighteen two through twenty-three. When you have it, say amen. Again, I'll be reading. NASB version. By chance, if you forgot your Bible, it's on the monitor for your reading as well. 1 John chapter 2, 18th verse says, Children, it is the last hour. And just as you heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us. They were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out so that it shall be shown that they are not of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you all know. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it. And because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar? But the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist. The one who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. Let us pray. Father, we thank you now. This opportunity to stand behind this sacred desk to declare thy holy reign. Lord, anoint me from the crown of my head to the sole of my feet. I may preach the gospel, see them with your Holy Ghost. Hide me behind the cross, let the blood of Jesus prevail. Lord, you said if I would go, you'd go with me. If I would open my mouth, you would speak for me. You find me now out on your word. Consecrate me now for thy service divine. Satan, take your hands off of God's property. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Let my soul Amen. You may be seated. Out of that passage, I want to talk from the subject, watch out for what you can't see. Watch out for what you can't see. Please listen very closely. In Billy Graham's book, Peace with God, 
there's a chapter entitled The Devil, in which Dr. Graham, he quotes a poem by Alfred J. Hughes. In that poem, there's some lines that go this way. Men don't believe in the devil now as their fathers used to. Can I preach this thing? As a nation and as individuals, have we tended to forget the source of evil? Perhaps this is just another symptom of society's now generally post-Christian perspective. But is a mistaken approach with serious consequences. Since the days of the New Testament, Satan has planted these deceivers in Christian churches where they prey on the untaught and on those who are disgruntled. Watch out for what you can't see. In other words, avoid spiritual deception. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. It says your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. But we live, we live in a day when the whole idea of spiritual discernment is minimized because spiritual truth is minimized. There's a slogan that says, doctrine divides. Let us set aside our doctrinal differences and come together on the areas we can agree on. Another popular mantra is Jesus said that they would know that we are disciples by our love, not by our doctrine. You see, the implication is set aside your doctrinal views and accept anyone who says that he believes in Jesus. I'm going to try to make it as plain as I can. Tolerance, unity, and love are viewed as much more important than doctrinal truth, which often smacks pride. Trust and believe. In my almost 15 years of pastoring, I've had my share of unpleasant encounters with those who are arrogantly a claim to have the truth. They beat you up with it, not showing much grace or kindness. But we should not allow such experiences to cause us to throw out the biblical emphasis on sound doctrine. Some of you in that class that Dr. Banks uh, talked about yesterday, you heard him mention doctrine. It is highly significant that John John, the apostle of love, who has just written that love is an essential mark of a true Christian in verses 7 through 11, now calls these false teachers antichrists and liars. He doesn't call, call them brothers in Christ who just have different ways of understanding things. He makes it plain that they are trying to deceive the true Christians and that they were not Christian in the sense of the term. Church, true biblical love is not divorced from an emphasis on biblical truth. To compromise the truth about a person and the work of Jesus Christ is to be hateful to the core. Because of such errors, because such errors result in eternal damnation of those who embrace it. Here's my first point. Here's my first point. To watch out for what you can't see. Be discerning people. To watch out what you can't see. Be discerning people. You see, God, John, he contrasts the false teachers with true believers. He addresses all of his readers as children implying that their vulnerability and the need to guard against these unprincipled men who were trying to deceive them right there in verse 26. And as a wise spiritual father, John is given important counsel that will help us watch out for what we can't see. Can I preach this thing? 
He says, he says, it is the last hour. Erase what you're thinking because that's not it. He said it is the last hour. Uh, that way that we know, that the way we know it's the last hour is that many antichrists have appeared. Walk with me in the scripture here. Some have said that John was mistakenly, he thought that Jesus would return in his lifetime. Can I teach this thing? Such a view undermines the divine inspiration of scripture. If you buy into it, you cannot trust anything that the apostles wrote. You, can, you, you, you become the judge of scripture according to what strikes you as true. This view also attacks the intelligence of the apostles. John had heard Jesus say, he heard Jesus say that no man, no one knows the hour he's coming in Matthew 24 and 36. It is not reasonable to accuse him of being mistaken about here about the time of his second coming. Rather, John, here it is, John is calling the entire period between Jesus' ascension and his return the last hour. No one knows how long this period will last. But the phrase, the last hour, it implies a sense of urgency in that Jesus may come at any moment. Come on, somebody. In Mark chapter 13, verse 33, Jesus concludes his teaching of the end times with this application to the wise hearer. He says, take heed, keep on alert, for you do not know when the appointed time will come. Come on, somebody. John says that a distinguishing feature of this age is that the Antichrist is coming and that even now many Antichrists have appeared. John is the only New Testament writer to use these words. And he uses it five times in four verses. But if you read your Bible, if you read the Bible, the concept of the Antichrist is more frequent. Look at John, uh, Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7 talks about the horn, and Revelation 13 talks about the beast. Both of them are referring to the Antichrist. Can I teach for a minute? Paul in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, he mentions the man of lawlessness who would exalt himself and display himself as being God. He's coming. His coming will be in according with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders. He will deceive many who will perish. When John says that the Antichrist is coming, he refers to this future evil leader. But when he says, even now many Antichrists have appeared, he means that the evil spirit that will characterize the final Antichrist is already working in these false teachers who have left the churches. The prefix anti can mean either instead of or in opposition to. Or it could, and it may contain to both ideas here. The false teachers rise up within the church, and here's what they do. They present a system that subtly presents something instead of Jesus Christ. The false teacher may use the same label, Jesus Christ, but he will not be the same Jesus Christ that presented in the Bible. Can I speak the truth? If a gullible person takes the bait, he is led farther and farther away until he is totally in opposition to Christ. We talked about that in Bible study. That's called drifting. False teachers whom John labels Antichrist did not carry pitchforks and wear uh, red suits with horns and tails and T-shirts that says, warning, I'm the Antichrist. Y'all quiet, hope you're listening. Rather, rather, they arose in the churches. Some of them may have been leaders in the church who for a while had taught the truth. 
Paul, he, he warned the Ephesians elders, from among yourselves men will rise, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after them. In Acts chapter 20, verse 30. Now, these men were leaving the church. They were leaving the church to form new groups, saying we have come into a deeper knowledge of the truth. Follow us, and we'll let you in on this secret knowledge. Can I give you some life applications to watch out for? First application is beware. Satan works in the realm of religion. False teachers, they adapt Christian terminology and posture themselves as being Christians, but they really are not. They usually begin within the church, and at first, their teaching is orthodox. They often have attractive personalities, and they build a following of people who seem to be helped by their teaching. But eventually, they begin subtly to veer from the truth. They may be, they may have multiple motives. Sometimes they fall into immorality and to justify their sin, they have to deny scripture. Or they may love the claim of being popular. See, it feels good to be in demand. As a man's popularity grows, he grows in power. Note also that there has never been a perfect church even in New Testament times where the apostle was still living. We sometimes idolize the early church thinking that if we could just get back to the New Testament principles, we wouldn't have to, we wouldn't have, to have all the problems that we constantly battle with in the modern church. Can I preach this thing? But these early churches had gone through the damage of false teachers in their midst who had now left the church to form new groups. Undoubtedly, they took with them people from the churches. Whenever that happens, those who still are in the church are confused and they're wounded. They wonder, why did our friends leave? They claim that, that they have found the truth now and that we are in the dark. Maybe there are, are problems here. Maybe we should leave too. See, this is how the enemy has worked from the earliest days of the church. And don't be surprised when it happens. Can I get another application? Beware of anyone who breaks from the true church to form a new group with new theology. Theology means the study of God. Look at the text. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. But if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out, and so it would be shown that they are not of us. It's right there in verse 19. John's words here do not apply to people who get disgruntled in one church and leave to form another church. While that practice is usually regrettable and sad, it is wrong to label those who left as heretics unless they have abandoned core Christian truths. I'm going to make it plain to you. Heretics not only eventually separate themselves from true Christians who form their own groups, but also they deviate from Christian doctrine on major issues. I'm trying to preach it where you can see it. They claim that they have the truth and the others do not, and that they see things that others do not see. Lord, help me to preach this thing. And they inevitably, they try to recruit others from within the church to join them. 
While each situation is painful and unpleasant, John's words here should prepare us to not be surprised or disheartened when it happens. If it happened to the churches under John's care, it can happen and will happen in churches today. But when it happens, we need to be biblically, biblically sound and rooted in sound doctrine about certain issues. Certain issues, certain biblical issues. You see, first of all, true Christians are born of God. The key issue with these false teachers was they were not of us. They did not view or did not share the same new life in Christ that brings us into the holy body, the church. So they left. They left or they felt free to leave. You can be on the membership list of the church without experience the new birth. What I believe that's important to join the church is far more important to make sure that you're truly of the church through the new birth. All right? So here's something I want to tell you. If you truly know Christ, you will persevere with the church. It's imperfect. It contains difficult and irritating people. But guess what, y'all? We still family. You can't, you, it's one thing on this life, you can't dictate who your family is. Can I preach this thing? Family is family no matter how they treat you. You were born into through this new birth, and so was everyone else who truly trusted in Christ. While you may not have picked those people in your family, God picked them, and you got to learn to get along with them. Can I preach it like I feel it? Now, although there may be times when you grate like sandpaper against your soul, it's by, it's by persevering with that God smooths out the rough edges. Tell your neighbor, church folk, you got to love them. You will experience hurt feelings and misunderstanding if you get involved in a local church. Be committed to work through these matters. Don't bail out on the church. There's another thing I want to let you know that John was more concerned about purity of doctrine than he was about church growth or unity. He never says we should go after these brothers and, and bring them back. Or let us set aside our differences and love these men. Rather, he says, in effect, their departure, it shows their true colors. Let them go. I didn't make this up, y'all. It's in the text. Of course, we need to evaluate the seriousness of the doctrinal matter at hand. Sometimes so sincere Christians have to agree to disagree or even to work in separate parts of the Lord's venue. But if the doctrinal issue is a core matter of faith, purity is much more important than unity or church growth. I hope y'all can see this thing. We should not measure a church's success by the numbers who attend but rather by its faithfulness to the truth of the gospel. Y'all know what the gospel is, right? John also says, beware. Satan works in the realm of religion. Beware of anyone who breaks from the true church to form new groups with new theology. Here's my second point. I only got two, Sister Ross. To watch out for what you can't see be discerning of doctrine. So watch out what you can't see. Be discerning of doctrine. Church, we live in a day that has rejected the ideal of absolute truth, especially in the spiritual realm. 
it smacks of arrogance to say that you know the truth and that others who do not share your view is wrong. You're free to have your own spiritual opinions as long as you don't claim that your view is the only true view. But note here, notice how contrast this is in John's statement in verse 20. Verse 20 says, you all know. And to verse 21, he says, I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Now that sure sounds like John believes in absolute truth in the spiritual realm and that you can and that you can know when you're right and others are wrong. Let me give you some more life applications on this point and I'll be done. First application I want to give you is sound doctrine really matters. Sound doctrine really matters. John says in verse 23, whoever denies the father, or whoever denies the son does not have the father. And the one who confesses the son has the father. You see it? Then he goes on to say in verse 25, and all of this concerns God's promise to us about eternal life. If you deny the truth about God's son as revealed in the New Testament, then you do not have the father and you do not have eternal life. So the Graham, there's a popular sentiment that says, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. Mm. When you share Christ with someone who buys into this thinking, they'll probably respond this way. It's nice that you believe that, but I have my own beliefs. Church, according to this view, Sincerity is the main thing. Truth doesn't matter. And that is utterly, utterly nonsense. Can I bring it closer? You can sincerely drink poison, believing that it is medicine, but it will kill you just the same. Haha, <laughs> it's tight, but it's right. In other words, sound doctrine really matters. Can I give you another application? Sound doctrine is totally linked with a personal relationship with God. John says that if you're not a son, you don't have the father. Right? He goes on to talk about abiding in the son and the father in verse 24. Because that probably be part two next week. Abiding in John's word for fellowship, abiding in John's word for fellowship or for a close relationship with God. His point is that if you deny cardinal truth about Jesus Christ and yet claim to know God, guess what you're doing? You're deceiving yourself. I'm trying to make it as plain as I can. But it's not to say, I want these up here to hear this. This is not to say that a new follower must be able to precisely correct theological statements about the Trinity or the two, two natures of Christ in order to be saved. But it is to say that if someone knowingly makes false statement about Christ and is not open to correction, their salvation is suspect. Sound doctrine necessarily goes along with a genuine personal relationship with God. Here's the last one. Here's the last application. Sound doctrine about the person and work of Christ is absolutely vital. Most heresies go astray with regard to the person or work of Jesus Christ. Heresy means false teachers. John Calvin, who's a commentary, John Calvin, he pointed out that since Christ is the sum of the gospel, Heretics especially aim their arrows at him, meaning Jesus Christ. The only way that we can know the Father is through the Son, according to John 14 and 6. False teachers were denying Jesus is the Christ in verse 22. 
This probably was more than a denial that Jesus was the Old Testament Messiah. The context here, which refers to Jesus as the Son of God, and which closely links the Father and the Son, indicate that these false teachers denied the full deity of Jesus Christ. They denied the incarnation. They took God on human flesh. They took God on human flesh in the virgin birth of Jesus. They taught that Jesus, they taught that the Christ came upon human Jesus at his baptism and departed as his crucifixion. John says they denied both the Father and the Son. The modern cults go astray on the person and work of Jesus Christ. They deny his deity and his death on the cross. They deny the Trinity by denying the Son of God. They do not have the Father. In the words of the apostle of love, they are liars, deceivers, and antichrists. Well, here's what you've been waiting on. I got the clothes and get y'all out of here. Church, we should be diligent to persevere, to, to, to preserve the unity of the body of Christ, but not at any cost. There is no room for compromise on the core beliefs of a Christian, especially the truth about the person of Christ and the gospel. Dickie Ray, during the World War, or during World War II, Neville Chamberlain of Britain, he tried to keep the peace by appeasing Adolf Hitler. After giving Poland to Hitler, Chamberlain went back to England proclaiming peace in our times. It is said an appeaser is one who feeds the crocodile hoping it would eat him last. Y'all get that when you get home. So sure enough, Hitler later tried to eat Britain too. Church, if we compromise truth to appease heresy, it will lead ultimately to our spiritual demise. Can I close this thing? To watch out for what you can't see. Be discerning people. To watch out for what you can't see. Be discerning of sound doctrine in order to do all of these things. Can I close it like I feel it? In order to do all of these things. To watch out for what you can't see. You must abide in God's word. The Bible says, Hebrew 4 and 12. For the word of the Lord is living and active. Sharper than any two-edged sword piercing to the vision of the soul and of the spirit of joints and of marrow discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart to watch out what you can't see you gotta know what the word says the word says in psalm 119 and 105 your word is a lamp to my feet your word is a light to my path to be in the word, you have to know what it says. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, it says, All scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Can I give you some more of what the word says? The Bible says, Isaiah 40 and 8, the grass with the flowers fade, but the word, but the word, but the word of God shall stand forever. The Bible says in Psalm 119 and 89, forever, 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 oh Lord. Your word, your word is fixed in the heavens. I wish I had somebody to know you know you know that the Bible says you got to know his word. You got to stand on his word. You got to stand 
when mama leaves you. You got to stand when daddy leaves you. When your church goes astray, you got to stand on his word. His word, say, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. His word said, I'll be there even, 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 even to the end of the age. Anybody in here, you know that you know you know. That you know you know, you know his word. I wish I had somebody that know his word will stand to your feet and say that the Bible says in everything, everything, let everything that have breath praise, 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 praise. praise. Ye the Lord. So come a day. If you don't know this word, you're going to be lost. So come a day. If you're not standing on this word, you're going to be lost. Well, he's just making it up. I think in Matthew chapter 4, whenever Jesus was led, y'all feel that? I said, I'm through preaching. When Jesus was led into the wilderness, after he was baptized, the Bible says the Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness. For 40 days, 40 nights, you have to watch out for what you can't see. Because the Bible says, while he was in that wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, the devil came to him. Now, Jimmy L., it's a theological argument. Was the devil there in spirit or was he there in person? But here's the thing, it don't make a difference. He was there. The Bible says he tempted him three times. I'm just giving you the first temptation. Because he, he went in the desert, I mean, the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. The Bible says he fasted. So that means what? He was, wasn't eating. So that means what? He was hungry. The devil appeared. If you be. If you be the son of God. Turn these stones into bread. How are you going to tempt somebody with something that you don't own? But Jesus answered him with the word. With the word, he said, man don't live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. But if you don't know this word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, you will give in to the temptation. John said, Antichrist will come. Some are even here now. They don't walk around with red suits, horns, and tails. They dress up. They put on suit and ties. They put on skirts and dresses. Even put on clergy collars. But if you don't know, then you don't know how or which way they're going to come at you to deceive you. Y'all know my favorite scripture. 1 Corinthians 2 and 14. Right? If you are not spiritually grounded, that Bible, if you're not spiritually grounded in this word, you can't see spiritual things because spiritual things seem foolish unto you. Can I bring it closer to you? If you're not rooted and grounded in this word, every word I said up there, it went past your head. You don't know who John is. Who's John? Who's John talking about? Talking about the same John that was apostle. There's many Johns in the Bible. John the Baptist? I'm not talking about John the Baptist. That's why you have to be rooted and grounded in this word. 
But in order to be rooted in his word, stand to your feet. You have to accept him as your savior. You have to accept him as your redeemer. You have to accept him as your Christ. So contrary to what you think, if you're not saved, you have not received the gift of salvation, God is not your father. He's only your creator. You can't accept someone to be your father if you have not been adopted into the family. So when you become saved, you give Christ your heart, you become adopted in your family. God becomes your father, Jesus becomes your big brother. And the Holy Spirit seals you with his presence. He leads and guides you into all spiritual truth. Because there's things happening right now that you can't see. Can I prove it to you with the word? The Bible says in Ephesians 6 and 12, we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but with principalities, things in heavenly realms and high places. So this thing going on right now, you can't even see. And if you're not saved, you have no protector. That's why the devil's having his way with you. If you're not saved, he said you can't be lukewarm. You're either hot or you're cold. The Bible said if you're lukewarm, guess what it do? Those who said that know the word. He will spew you out of his mouth. Maybe someone here wants to come and receive Jesus as your Savior. He's waiting on you. He's waiting on you. Don't worry about what he, she, they say, they say. They have put a lot of people in hell and they have put a lot of people in the grave. I'm just being real as I can. Matter of fact, next time somebody come tell you they said something, ask them who they is. I can't bet.